America. My name is Dylan John, and you are listening to Nature and the Nation. This podcast uses the format of a book review to explore the intersection of philosophical naturalism with paleoconservatism within the framework of the revitalization of the Republican Party. We will be exploring politics, philosophy, psychology, and sociology through a wide variety of books published both recently and historically. Thank you for tuning in. For today's episode, we will be looking at On Being a Pagan by Alain de Benoit. This book was originally published in 1981 in French, and uh, it's pretty involved. It's not entirely what I was expecting. He really compares paganism with Christianity, uh, and I would say that a good two-thirds of the book, at least, is really describing Christianity and a polemic against Christianity, and the remainder is describing the pagan counterpoint. So it's really more of a refutation of Christianity than a- an explanation of paganism. But it's very involved, and it really picks up some of the conversation that we had last left off when we were looking at Friedrich Nietzsche's genealogy of morality. This continues some of those moral arguments, as well as a whole host of different areas where, where Christianity is compared with paganism. Uh, there are, I think, eight sections in this that I want to read to you. So a fair amount of sections. Some of them are rather short, uh, but not all of them. So hopefully we'll be able to get through this in a pretty reasonable amount of time. Like all of my episodes, I'm going to be reading some significant portions of the book to you so that you can get a real feel for what he's saying and how he's describing it. Um, less concerned with reviewing the book itself, although I, I am concerned with that to an extent, but more concerned with looking at the arguments that he makes and seeing how we can incorporate those arguments into some of the themes that we've been developing over the course of this podcast and relating it back to some of the stuff that we saw in previous books. So with that said, I'm going to get in and start reading the first section that I wanted to read. This is just a sort of an overview um, early on in the book. I, I believe this is in chapter... Four. So the chapters are pretty short. So this is chapter four, but it's still pretty early in the book. Uh, but in this section, he he kind of compares a pagan moral system to a Christian moral system. And I think this should sound sort of familiar if you're familiar with Nietzsche or if you listened to the episode when I reviewed uh, the genealogy of morals. So in this part, he says, quote, When it comes to specifying the values, particular to paganism, People have generally listed features such as these, an eminently aristocratic conception of the human individual, an ethics founded on honor, shame rather than sin, an heroic attitude toward life's challenges, the exaltation and sacralization of the world, beauty, the body, strength, health, the rejection of any worlds beyond, the inseparability of morality and aesthetics, and so on. From this perspective, the highest value is undoubtedly not a form of justice, whose purpose is essentially interpreted as flattening the social order in the name of equality, but everything that can allow a man to surpass himself. For paganism, it is pure absurdity to consider the results of the workings of life's basic framework as unjust. In the pagan ethic of honor, the classic antitheses noble versus base Courageous versus cowardly, honorable versus dishonorable, beautiful versus deformed, sick versus healthy, and so forth, replace the antitheses operative in a morality based on the concept of sin. Good versus evil, humble versus vainglorious, submissive versus proud, weak versus arrogant, modest versus boastful, and so on. However, while all this appears to be accurate, the fundamental feature, in my opinion, is something else entirely. It lies in the denial of dualism. Expanding on what Martin Buber said about Judaism, it seems that Judeo-Christianity stands out less for its beliefs in a single God than by the nature of the relationships it suggests between man and God. In any case, it has been a long time since the conflict between monotheism and polytheism was boiled down to a simple quarrel over the number of gods. End quote. So there he sort of sets up the uh, system based on honor, He says an ethics founded on honor. Uh, 
and compares shame rather than sin. So you've got honor and shame as one moral system, and then uh, sin and and um, redemption as the other moral system. Uh, and so one system is attempting, obviously, to avoid shame, and the other attempting to avoid sin. But there's a lot more to it in the sense that original sin creates a situation where everyone's default state in Christianity is a sinful state. Um, and in paganism, the de- shame is not the default setting. You're, you're totally in control of whether you live an honorable life or a shameful life. And so there's, there are fundamental differences in the, in the moral system between these two. And those we'll get, we'll get into more detail in that uh, as we go. But he, he says it boils down to dualism. And he talks about dualism. The, the next section I want to quote talks about dualism. And, uh, and that, it, that it's not really about the number of gods, one god versus many gods. That's only a superficial approach that it's really about the relationship of man to God versus the relationship of man to gods. That relationship is different in those two scenarios. And that is where, that's really what it boils down to. Uh, He quotes just afterwards, he quotes Paul Tillich saying, polytheism is a qualitative and not quantitative concept. So it's not just a matter of the number of gods. Anyway, I'm going to move in here where he starts talking about dualism. So in this section, he says, quote, it could be said, that all of Judeo-Christian theology rests on the separation of the created being, the world, from the uncreated being, God. The absolute is not the world. The first source of creation is entirely distinct from nature. The world is not divine. It is not the body of God. It is neither eternal, nor uncreated, nor ontologically self-sufficient. It is not a direct emanation or a modality of the divine substance nor is its nature or essence divine. There is but one absolute, and this absolute is God, which is uncreated, without genesis, or becoming, and ontologically sufficient unto itself. Everything that is not God is the work of God. There is no middle term, middle stage, or intermediary stage between to create and to be created. Between God and the world there is only nothingness, an abyss, that God alone can fill. Completely alien to the world, God is the antithesis of all tangible reality. He is not an aspect, a sum, a level, a form, or a quality of the world. The world is entirely distinct from God, its creator. The First Vatican Council of 1870 reminds us. In the Judeo-Christian perspective, dualism is connected to the theology of creation. The idea of creation, writes Claude Tresmontant, implies the radical distinction between creator and the created, and the transcendence of the creator. This is the assertion that constitutes the very opening of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How was this creation made? It was created ex nihilo, out of nothing. God did not create the world out of shapeless and unorganized matter, out of a chaos that existed before him and on which he would have worked, in which case he would simply be an organizing demiurge, and there would be two non-created absolutes, God and matter. It cannot even be said that before God there was nothingness, because from the theological point of view, nothingness has neither reality nor qualities. Before the world, there was only God. In the Kabbalistic tradition, the first chapter of Genesis is perceived as the unfolding of creation out of a pre-existing divine universe, God therefore pulled the universe out of himself, and yet the world is not a part of God, because then it would be equally divine. Nor did God engender the world, for it is not consubstantial with him. Only the logos of God, engendered and not created, is consubstantial with God. He created it. By virtue of this fact, the relationship connecting God to man is both causal, God is the primal cause of all creatures, and moral. Man must obey God, because he is God's creature. At the source of pagan thought, by contrast, one finds that the world is animated, and that the soul of the world is alive. All creation comes exclusively from nature and the world. The universe is the sole being, and there cannot be any others. 
Its essence is not distinct from its existence. The world is non-created. It is eternal and imperishable. There has been no beginning, or rather, if there was one, it was the start of a new cycle. God only achieves and realizes himself by and in the world. Theogony is identical to cosmogony. The soul is a piece of the divine substance. The substance or essence of God is the same as that of the world. The divine is imminent in and consubstantial with the world. End quote. So what he's talking about here is a sort of pantheism that, that instead of God being the eternal force which created the world, the world itself is the eternal, all-encompassing thing, and the gods are contained within that world. That's the pagan view. So there's so it's it's a question of duality whether there's in the Judeo-Christian system there is a god that is entirely separate from the world and the bridge between the god between god and the world is is insurmountable by any created entity so man can't cross that gap of course only god can cross that gap and so that creates a, a dualistic system where all sacredness is drained essentially from the world the world is desacralized demystified and the and the sacred and the divine exists solely in another entity outside of the world in which we live and any divinity that enters this world comes only through the grace of god so that's the duality that's present that he's kind of tracing to the source of the of the real divide between uh, Judeo-Christianity and polytheistic paganism, or paganism in general. So from here I want to jump to a later part of the book, We're moving forward to chapter 17 on this one, when he talks about tolerance, and tolerance within, uh, within paganism and Christianity, or Judeo-Christianity. He says, quote, It is generally acknowledged that paganism contains a constituent principle of tolerance. A system that accepts a limitless number of gods not only accepts the plurality of the forms of worship that address them, but also, and especially, the plurality of mores, social and political systems, conceptions of the world for which these gods are so many sublimated expressions. We know that the ancients believed that the best proof that all the gods did or could exist was that the people worshipping them also existed. In Athens, there was even an altar to the unknown god. This freedom of thought resulting from the absence of all religious dogma was quite naturally transposed onto the political plane. For centuries, the Roman Empire respected the customs and institutions of all the people it conquered. It multiplied the number of provincial cities and organized their freedoms. It knew how to federate people without subjugating them. Pagan tolerance, which subsequently played into the hands of Christian propaganda in some instances, is expressed in these words of Symmachus. To each his customs, to each his rights. The divine spirit has given certain guardians to the cities. Just as each mortal receives a soul at birth, each people receives its guardian spirits. End quote. And so obviously that's a a much shorter section, but he's introducing the idea that, and it's pretty self-evident, I suppose, that in a polytheistic system, there is a certain tolerance for different gods. Each god would have their own cult, so the cult of one like even in ancient Greece, the cult of Zeus would have different practices, say, than the cult of Apollo, and they would recognize that these cults have different systems, they have different um, uh, traditions, and it, it spreads out from just the religious rite as such into the, tr- the, the basic traditions of different people, different cities. One city, would, like Athens, had a, the, Athena was the patron goddess, and other cities had different patron gods and goddesses and would expect the cities to operate differently, have different systems in accord with the dictates of their deity. And it would also say that, say, the the um, you know, the northern barbarians or whatever, they had their own gods, and people from this place had their own gods, the Egyptians had their own gods, and it was understood that each people has their own set of gods, and it wasn't there wasn't an idea that those other gods need to be Uh, conquered or those other gods need to be replaced with our gods the idea was more that every group of people has their own system they have their own gods and um, 
that automatically kind of fostered a sense of of tolerance for other people's ways because their ways were dictated by their gods just as your ways are dictated by your gods. And so that sort of tolerant uh, attitude kind of flowed through the the um, the pagan polytheistic world. Now, I want to bring up more of the uh, Christian approach, and specifically the Christian idea of uh, the brotherhood of mankind. Uh, this is, I think, an interesting topic because when you propose that there, when you propose that there is only one God, and that all people on Earth come from that one God, that this is the one Creator God, every human being is therefore a child of God, if you will, and that's a concept that we still see today that everybody is a child of God. So. In that sense, everybody achieves this state of universal brotherhood, uh, which is not the same as the pagan ideal where there, there was no one God who would be the God of all mankind. So there was no brotherhood of man in that sense. So he says, quote, One immediate consequence of the reference to a single father is that the fraternity of the sons knows no bounds. All men are brothers. But precisely as a result of this, such a fraternity becomes impractical. Human societies create true fraternity on the basis of a founding myth of common ancestry. However, this ancestry needs to be demarcated in such a way that a specific distinction can be made between those who belong to one family and who belong to another. Relatively speaking, at least, fraternity is only possible with an alter ego, members of the same city, the same nation, the same people, or the same culture. If all men are brothers outside of any specifically human paradigm, then no one can truly be a brother. The institution of a symbolically universal paternity annihilates the very possibility of true fraternity in such a way that it proclaims itself in the absolute by the very thing that destroys it. End quote. So essentially the idea here is that the, the concept of, a, of brotherhood or is rooted in the concept of family. And the concept of family is essentially nonsensical if you haven't got another family to oppose it to. Or to say that this person is a member of the family and that person is not a member of the family. That's what makes a family a family. With it, when everybody is... When, you're, when you treat everybody like your brother... You know, whether it's your biological brother or a stranger that you've never met and you treat them the same, then you're dismantling the notion of family because family is predicated on the idea that you treat your brother differently than you treat a stranger. That's what makes a family is that you have a connection that is more than the connection that you have with humanity at large, right? So the whole idea of this brotherhood of man is a nonsensical concept, but it's rooted in the idea that we all have one father, our, that God is our father, the father of all humanity, dismantles all distinction and all capacity to have individual clusters of groups. It drives us toward this completely impractical situation of the brotherhood of man that is in stark opposition to human nature. Human nature is one of forming tribes, families, and groups. So, moving on from that concept of the brotherhood of man, I want to jump to... Uh, when he talks, he talks again about the plurality of culture under paganism. So, in this part, uh, he says, quote, Pagan thought which is fundamentally attached to roots and to place, as the preferred center around which identity can crystallize, can only reject all religious and philosophical forms of universalism. Universalism, to the contrary, finds its basis in Judeo-Christian monotheism. This universalist assertion of the unity of man as man is apparently devoid of all foundations. For the ancients, Man did not exist. There were only men. Greeks, Romans, barbarians, Syrians, and so forth. 
In the early 19th century, Joseph de Maistre repeats this idea, nominal in nature, when he wrote, There is no such thing as man in the world. In my life, I have seen Frenchmen, Italians, Russians, and so on. I even know, thanks to Montesquieu, that one can be Persian. But when it comes to man, I declare that I have never in my life actually met one. Of course, one can always speak of man in the singular, in common parlance, but this is only a convenience of language, nothing but an abstraction, that in the final analysis is based on the perception of a certain number of individual men. Generic man, universal, abstract man, does not exist. For a generic man to exist, there needs to be a common and specifically human referent capable of qualifying all men in a paradigmatic way. Such a referent would be necessarily cultural, as what distinguishes man in the world as we know it is his capacity as man to create cultures. Now there is no such thing as a unique human culture. There are only cultures. The diversity of cultures stems precisely from the diversity of men. What does exist, on the other hand, is a zoological unity of the human species. Strictly speaking, humanity is the human species. But such a notion is of a purely biological order. The idea of a generic man, an abstract, universal man, has also not been spared secularization at the hands of modern ideologies. As said earlier, it constitutes the heart of the ideology of the rights of man. It is also present in Marx, who in a famous passage defined communism as the real appropriation of the human essence by man for man. One can also feel that it is this spontaneous adherence by Marx to the approach consisting of the systematic deduction of the particular out of the general that led him throughout all his work to minimize the importance of human differences. This is already noticeable in his approach, ambiguous to say the least, to the national question, as well as in his polemics against the anarchists and certain revolutionary syndicalists. Classless society in Marxist futurology will be perfectly homogeneous and uniform. Generic man will be realized completely there. Against Bakunin, Marx challenges the difference that is for him synonymous with distance. He ignores or chooses to ignore the notion of pluralism. In his Republic, he abolishes all stratification and differentiation and replaces it with coordination and subordination. But the idea of generic man can also be found in the works of Engels, Morgan, Levi Strauss, or Freud. End quote. So I think there's a bit of a challenge with this section, like I've been talking about it a lot of the books, that, that there is in fact a human nature, right? There's a certain, there are certain tendencies that all people have that's hardwired into us just by nature of being human. We're not blank slates. They're like, you know, like he says, one of the things that defines being human is the creation of culture. There's no, there are no humans that don't create culture. But more specifically than that, we create culture along certain guidelines. There are certain prohibitions common among all the cultures of the world. Now, obviously, there are vast differences between all the cultures of the world as well, but there are common parts as well. So when you study humanity, you actually really have to find a sort of a balance. It's not a one or the other where there is a, there is this universal generic man, and then on the other hand, there are no two people alike. It's a combination of the two, right? It's more subtle than that. But I think it's important to recognize that um, paganism does postulate uh, individual people, individual cultures, and the particularity, and kind of elevates the particularity and the uniqueness of people and groups of people, and whereas uh, Christianity elevates the commonality of all people as being equal in the eyes of God or equal in the eyes of the law or whatever. It, it Christianity emphasizes the unification of people and the, and the sameness of people and discounts the differences between them as being uh, worldly. So moving on from that, Uh, he begins to talk about uh, universal peace. And this is, you know, this is obviously not like right after that. This is a few chapters later. Um, 
But in this, this is actually toward the end of the book. In this quote, he says, he says, quote, As an ideal at the end of history, the Bible aspires to universal peace. These words of Isaiah are inscribed in enormous letters on the front wall of the United Nations building in New York. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. The coming of the rule of the one God entails the abolition of the conflicts born out of the diversity of the real world. The same occurs in Marx with the realization of a classless society. History, like existence, is eluded by an internal solution that guarantees the final solution, the state of non-contradiction, the end of the secular theodicy, the homogeneous and conflictless society. In this sense, Marx falls under the criticism of Nietzsche, denouncing the metaphysical illusion in his own way. This world is contradictory, therefore there is a world stripped of contradictions. This ideal of universal peace is an ideal of non-contradiction, which logically implies the disappearance of differences. And until that disappearance, the, their theoretical devaluation, as it is differences that generate the contradictory. Contradiction is the very motor of life. The desire to make it vanish is a death wish. It is entirely different in paganism, where the conflict of opposites and its resolution in and by the being of the world sacralizes the struggle as a positive, fundamental reality. Struggle is not the foundation of an order, but forms the framework of the universe. Implying both conservation and transformation, contradiction, which is not mechanistic and fixed but clearly dialectical, ensures its own transcendence. At the empirical and preconceptual stage, we can find the clearest perception of it from the time of high antiquity, notably by Heraclitus. It must be known that the fight is universal, that justice is a struggle, that all things are born in accordance with struggle and necessity. Regarding Heraclitus, Nietzsche writes, The strife of the opposites gives birth to all that comes to be. The definite qualities that look permanent to us express but the momentary ascendancy of one partner. But this by no means signifies the end of the war. The contest endures for all eternity. Everything that happens, happens in accordance with this strife, and it is just in this strife that eternal justice is revealed. It is a wonderful idea, welling up from the purest strings of Hellenism, the idea that strife embodies the everlasting sovereignty of strict justice, bound to everlasting laws. It is Hesiod's good Eris, transformed into the cosmic principle. It is the contest idea of the Greek individual and the Greek state, taken from the gymnasium and the palestra, from the artist's agon, from the contest between political parties and cities, all transformed into universal application, so that now the wheels of the cosmos turn on it. In the spirit of paganism, even the public enemy cannot represent evil in and of itself. It always remains a relative adversary. Furthermore, reciprocal esteem may be born from this confrontation. Far from necessitating the dishonoring of the enemy in order to fight him, an inevitable obligation in a pacifist system. By the same token, an opponent can be acknowledged as a peer for standing up and fighting well. Hence, the fundamentally pagan appeal to the fraternal adversary, an appeal rarely heard today, I should note, that is the strict opposite of the forgiveness for offenses and the left cheek that is presented after the right cheek has been slapped. End quote. So I think this is an important part, particularly the last thing that he says. So, so just in summary, you've got an idea of universal peace. And this is through the elimination of contradiction and the differences. So this kind of ties back before the, 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 the things that divide us as people and just in general, the things that divide entities from entities, um, the end state of Judeo-Christian theology is, is the elimination of all contradictions such that the lion shall lay down with the lamb. And the conflict and contradiction in the world 
will be removed. And in so, if those conflicts and contradictions are not removed, they're at best devalued. Um, and so in the end here, he says, oh, also, like he, he does talk about Heraclitus. Heraclitus is famous for saying that, that struggle is the source of, of all um, existence. And, uh, and Nietzsche talks about that as little. But what I want to point out is, is the end, when he says, uh, I'm going to just reread this section. So he says, quote, In the spirit of paganism, even the public enemy cannot represent evil in and of itself. It always remains a relative adversary. Furthermore, reciprocal esteem may be born from this confrontation. Far from necessitating the dishonoring of the enemy in order to fight him, an inevitable obligation in a pacifist system, by the same token, an opponent can be acknowledged as a peer for standing up and fighting well. So, essentially, there is an inevitable obligation in a pacifist system of dishonoring the enemy in order to fight him. What this means is that if you are in a system which is ultimately pacifist, and if your ultimate objective is the elimination of all conflict and confrontation, all, all strife, then you, you can't engage in struggle without first making your opponent going from a, from a, a fraternal adversary into an evil entity. You're only justified in engaging in conflict if you are, if you believe in this pacifist, uh, a universal peace. The only mechanism you have for engaging in conflict is by demonizing your opponent into a from a, from a fraternal adversary into an evil opponent. And so you can even see you can even see this in the concept of like even on. This, when I drive home from work, I pass by this little sign someone has in front of their house that says, Love trumps hate. So what does that mean, love trumps hate? Well, you've got a system of love where people love each other, and you've got a system of hate where people hate each other. And the hateful system is the system of strife and conflict. And the loving system is the system of, of the brotherhood of man and universal peace. And in order for the... for uh, this universal peace to come about, the system of hatred has to be destroyed, right? So there has to be a conflict. It has to be the destruction of the system of hatred. So the idea that two groups of people could have in their hearts both love and hate, that one side could have love and hate within them, and the other side, as human beings, also has love and hate within them. And these two sides, neither of whom has a monopoly on good or evil, can conflict with each other and even generate a sense of respect for one another by standing up for their values. That this can be like, uh, a, like I said, the fraternal conflict. Instead of that, that, because that would allow for a system that says that strife and conflict are acceptable parts of the world. But we can't have that. Because we don't believe in that sort of a world. We don't believe that that strife is a is a positive mechanism of the world. Because then we would it would become nonsensical to say that what we're striving for is universal peace. So if we're striving for universal peace, we have to demonize the enemy in order to justify the conflict. So I'm gonna move on from there. All right, so this part, uh, he says, quote, Nietzsche believed he could identify in monotheism's origins the trace of an old personality change, the imprint of a compensation for a feeling of inferiority. So as not to lose face, someone who cannot do something claims that he does not want to do it, or that to want to do it is evil. The same is true in Judeo-Christianity. To the extent that everything strong and great is viewed by man as superhuman, as alien to himself, man diminishes. He divides between two spheres his two aspects, one pitiable and weak, the other strong and gripping. 
The first sphere he calls man, the second, God. The ideal can always be seen, but it is seen as inaccessible, and thereon transferred to an equally unattainable God. The invention of an absolute superiority will tend to justify a relative inferiority. Everything the believer places under the idea of God is, in fact, pilfered from man himself, as if through a series of communicating vessels. Everything then takes place as if God's greatness was only the repression of neurotic man. Here, the system and its discourse begin to obey their own logic. The man who becomes alienated from his own freedom because he is incapable of making full use of it and places it in a desire for compensation in the power of a single and remote God accepts in advance the very principle of his mutilation. It is because he feels subjugated that he transforms this submission into intentional servitude through the angle of a covenant with a master who holds the omnipotence he does not. By so doing, he condemns himself to eternal suffering. But he makes this suffering the very justification of his existence and of his critical attitude toward the world. End quote. So what we're seeing here is the idea that man has a, a strength and a weakness within him, a greatness and a fallenness within him. And monotheism, by postulating uh, the single deity as omnipotent, as all-powerful, uh, the absolute source of goodness in the world, man then takes those elements within himself of, of greatness and strength and passes that to God and keeps for himself the fallenness, the sinfulness, uh, the weakness, because to take greatness into yourself would be seen as competing with God. When you strive to achieve more and more, it's like the, tower, the, the, the story of the Tower of Babel, which he talks about in here, um, that it's, this, it's man's, like man creating a testament to himself. Um, mankind attempting to become like God, right? This sort of, this sort of like unbridled striving that God then punishes because mankind is not supposed to have that sort of pridefulness, right? You, sh you shouldn't be proud in that way. You should, be, you should be humble before God, right? And so that sort of pridefulness and um, desire to surpass oneself, to be better and better, is taken out of yourself and given to the ultimately superior. And mankind is thereby debased in that state. That comes back to like what Nietzsche had said, and it, it, uh, it, it also he says the last thing he says that uh, he condemns himself to eternal suffering, but he makes this suffering the very justification of his existence, and of his critical attitude toward the world, so that the world is this. This ties back in with the dualism. The world itself, the material world, doesn't have any of those qualities which one must reserve for God. So the greatness, the, um, the eternalness, th those sorts of things. And the world itself becomes debased and, you know, the, 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 the material world is ruled by Satan or what have you. Um, ma material things are considered base and unholy in that way. And that's the source of this critical attitude toward reality. So moving on from there, uh, he goes on later on to talk about uh, privilege. And he says, quote, it is in the Bible, writes Ernst Bloch, that we find the most impassioned reaction against those on high and against worshiping them. Only the Bible contains an appeal to revolt against them. This appeal to social revolution finds its most enthusiastic forms in the books of the prophets, whose tragic fate stems from the fact that they continually developed in the face of the powerful a perpetually critical ideology. This is the social ideal of Jewish propheticism, writes Gerard Walter a sort of general leveling that will cause the disappearance of all class distinction and lead to the creation of a uniform society, 
in which privileges of any kind will be banned. This egalitarian sentiment goes hand in hand with an irreducible animosity toward the rich and powerful, which will be, who will be denied entry into the future kingdom. On countless occasions, the Bible condemns as intrinsically evil imperial undertakings and powerful cities and nations. It multiplies the anathemas against the haughty ones, who by the same token are also the accursed. It calls for the toppling of beauty, power, and pride. To the pluralism of civilizations and their achievements, born from the creative will of men, it opposes the voluntary deprivation of the monotheist affirmation, the desert of the absolute, the equality in the non-created being. It legitimizes weakness and makes strength illegal. A day will come when the weak, who are the just, will triumph, and when the powerful are cast down from their thrones and when human pretensions will crumble before Yahweh. This will be the day of the Lord of hosts, over all that has been raised up, so that it may be rebuilt. Human pride will be humiliated, the arrogance of man will be humbled, and Yahweh shall be exalted. For Yahweh knows how to humble those who walk in pride. This conception of social justice, based on a spirit of revenge and resentment, anticipates all forms of socialism. The Bible identifies the relationship with God with social justice, but this affirmation is only a means of contesting human authority in principle, and not in one or another of its applications. It is for this reason that the prophets, by mounting a full frontal opposition to the princes of this world, can appear as the fathers of the socialism of liberation, the first theoreticians of the resistance to mastery, or, as Roger Garotti puts it, the pioneers of the struggle against alienation. Yahweh, writes Jean Lacroix in his commentary on Ernst Bloch, is he who directs the subversive preaching of social apocalypse. He contests human alienation, but only to replace it with another form against which there is no recourse. It would also be in this spirit it seems to me that we must interpret the constant preference shown by the Bible within its family stories for younger brothers, in other words, for those who come second. In Genesis, Abel is the younger brother of Cain. Moses is also the younger brother of Aaron. Isaac, the second son of Abraham, is preferred over Ishmael, his elder half-brother. This opposition is particularly explicit in the case of the twins Esau and Jacob. Esau was the first to be born, and the Bible explicitly states that he fought with his brother in Rebekah's belly before birth because he wanted to come out first. Now Jacob and Esau correspond to symbolic types that are quite co comparable to those of Cain and Abel. Esau is a redhead and hairy. He is also a hunter. He will wed Hittite women and have as a descendant Edom, also called Ser, who would become the enemy of Israel. Jacob, to the contrary, continued the nomadic lifestyle. He was a tranquil man, remaining beneath his tents. In Judaic tradition, Esau refused to be circumcised, whereas Jacob was circumcised at birth. The parallel with Cain and Abel is striking, but it is a reverse parallel. Because where Cain killed Abel, Jacob killed Esau as the firstborn by buying back his birthright as the elder son. He then by deceiving his father as to his true identity, obtained the blessing of Isaac. Now, what would be the right of the elder, if not the fact of naturally coming first, according to the order of things of this world? To this natural hierarchy, the Bible opposes another, the hierarchy according to Yahweh, which represents its reversal. The preference given the younger versus the elder brother is only a metaphor, for the preference given to the second, to the last, as opposed to the first, to the weak against the powerful, to he who is humble, therefore blessed by Yahweh, against he who is proud, therefore pagan. The biblical narrative itself further shows the general range of this metaphor. When Yahweh tells Rebekah, pregnant with Jacob and Esau, there are two nations in your womb, two peoples, that once issued from you will separate. One people will dominate the other. The elder will serve the younger. 
This is already the announcement of his selection. Nothing more would remain to be said if Yahweh claimed to be correcting a particular unjustified situation, if he claimed to be reacting against the ever-present possibility of an abuse of authority. But that is not what is involved here. It is not the abuse of power that Yahweh condemns. It is power itself. From the biblical perspective, human power established as sovereign is intrinsically evil. It is evil in its very essence. The just are not just in one part and weak in another. They are just because they are weak, by very virtue of this weakness, just as the powerful are evil by very virtue of their power. So it is not the weak that are touted by the Bible as much as weakness itself. End quote. So that comes right back to Nietzsche as well, and he talks about the elder and the younger brothers, and it's that it's not an abuse of power for the elder to be first and for the younger to be second. It's That is the natural unfolding of reality. The elder is automatically older and more powerful and more experienced than the younger. That's just the way nature and reality work. But it's that natural power of the elder over the younger that is considered wrong in biblical morality. And that's how the last become the first. That's how the, the, those who are high will be toppled down and those who are low will be elevated up. It's a reversal of the very premise of power in the world. So, then from there, there's, uh, I think, only one more section that I want to read that should close this up. When he talks about, uh, we sort of follow along this a little bit, he talks about morality and sin and guilt. And in this section, he says, quote, Christianity, says Nietzsche, is the most prodigal elaboration of the moral theme to which humanity has ever been subjected. Biblical morality is not, of course, deduced from a vision of the tangible world or from concrete experience as lived by human beings. It comes exclusively from the will of Yahweh and the prohibitions he has pronounced. Adam and Eve's transgression, as we have seen, consists of wishing to determine for themselves the criteria of good and evil. Now, only Yahweh possesses this right. It is given that he alone defines what is good and what is evil, and constitutes them into absolutes, and furthermore, he is also the one who rewards or punishes. What befalls man befalls him necessarily with respect to the moral value of his actions. Such a system imprisons man within a problematic of unhealthy explanation. If there are concretely evil events, it is because there are morally evil actions. This is the source for guilt feelings and bad conscience. Far from abasing themselves and crucifying themselves by means of their beliefs, the Greeks, writes Nietzsche, to the contrary, used their gods to protect them against any vague urge of guilty conscience, to have the right to play in peace with their freedom of soul. There is none of this in Judeo-Christian monotheism, which uses pain as one of the surest means to perpetuate its morality. Only that which never ceases to cause suffering remains in memory, observes Nietzsche again. The best way for Yahweh to be never forgotten is for him to inscribe himself in the human heart as a sign of unfulfillment as suffering produced by sin. The priest explains suffering, illness, poverty, captivity, captivity by transgression. He suggests the ways it can be expiated. For him, pain is the most powerful aid to memory. The Bible gives him a poisonous explanation. If one is suffering, it is because one deserves to. It is because one has sinned. Pain is not only painful, it is also a sign of guilt. Accepting the principles of this guilt-inducing condition comes down to understanding the reasons suffering exists, an understanding that mitigates suffering somewhat because it also lays out the hopeful principle of the sinner's redemption, a radical comprehension of his suffering in this world, but this also renders it interminable by virtue of its inclusion within the most intrinsically perfect system for its reproduction. Why would biblical morality, in Nietzsche's words, constitute the most terrible illness that has ever raged among mankind? Because of the dualistic vision that supports it. 
because it functions according to abstract categories without the slightest fundamental relation to the world, because it imposes upon the world a code whose sources are outside of the world, because it renders life foreign to itself and prevents it from realizing itself, because it ruptures vital ardor and creative energy by imposing eternal limitations upon them. This overly exclusive reading of the human condition, for good and evil must obviously coexist, bursts the coherence and unity of life. Life finds itself divided piecemeal and split apart, in other words, incapable of realizing itself. In this way, morality defines life according to criteria that are not its own and are not determinative of its specific effectiveness. Such a problematic imposed on life from without prevents it from achieving its virtual qualities. Life no longer stems from its own creativity. By arbitrarily dictating laws that do not spring from its own legitimacy, that of its sensibility, morality forbids it from being itself. In Judeo-Christian monotheism, life is not valued according to its own problematic, but subjected to another. No longer will man be judged according to his law and his measure, but according to those of something entirely other. This is why the progression of Christian morality and history can also be read as a decline in energy. Christian morality is burdened by resentment. The believer accepts his own debasement in exchange for the hope that others may also be debased. He adheres to a morality that suppresses diversity in the name of equality that belittles in the name of justice, that curdles in the name of love. Such a morality is a system to dissipate energy, chip away at health, and destroy potency. It culminates, when all is said and done, with fusion and confusion, with entropy and death. It reveals itself, once identified, to be pure negation, like the death instinct. Here, Eros is merely the mask of Thanatos. For confronted with morality especially Christian or unconditional morality, life must continually and inevitably be in the wrong, writes Nietzsche, because life is something essentially amoral, and eventually, crushed by the weight of contempt and the eternal no, life must then be felt to be unworthy of desire and altogether worthless. Morality itself, how now? Might not morality be a will to negate life, a secret instinct of annihilation, a principle of decay, diminution, and slander, the beginning of the end. Pagan man is, by nature, innocent. Certainly over the course of his life, he will have responsibilities to assume one or another of his actions, by implicating him in a situation or confirmation of given facts, may cause a feeling of guilt to arise within him. But this feeling always results from voluntary choices he has made. Man does not inherit at birth any guilt, any imperfection bound to his very condition other than those of his psychic or physiological limitations which are exempt from moral implications. He is, at the onset, pure innocence, innocence incarnate, and he puts this innocence into serious action like a child puts it into play, to transform action into a game. Because only the game is truly serious. The game of man, the game of being, the game of the world. The game is fundamentally innocent, beyond good and evil. When he describes the Trojans' assault on the wall the Achaeans erected to protect their camp, Homer himself compares the actions of the gods to the games of children. Montherlant said that the game is the sole form of activity that should be taken seriously. Lastly, Schiller declares, man is not fully man, except when he plays. This is why it is the child who is the closest of all people to the Superman. The world of the Superman, to paraphrase Montherlant, is a world whose prince is a child. End quote. So that's basically saying, so that was a long section there, but it's basically saying that um, essentially paganism doesn't have the concept of original sin. And so a newborn babe is pure innocence, has not committed any transgressions. And there's no, there's no existential guilt 
fundamentally bound to the human being. There's no moral wrong that one is automatically and everywhere guilty of. And so that to approach life in the manner of a child is to approach a manner from a position of innocence. And that innocence is the, is the position that, that one finds himself in when pursuing greatness. And he also talks about how Christian morality is burdened by resentment and uh, that it chips away at health and strength and destroys potency. And this is very much a continuation of some of the things that I talked about in the last quote. And he's, he's essentially, essentially saying that the very premise of original sin is, is a pain and guilt inscribed upon humanity such that they will never forget that Yahweh is their master. Which kind of comes across as fundamentally unhealthy from my perspective. And I think also from de Benoit's perspective. And also he does get into the guilt there, the, the, the perpetual guilt that we had talked about in, our, in the previous episode. So it's nice to be able to uh, kind of explore that a little bit further. So I'm going to bring it to a close now. Thanks for listening, and uh, I hope you come back next episode. Bye.